Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast. Today, as my guest, I have Anthony Kunduris. Anthony is the author of Run Frictionless. He's developed the 4Q framework, and he's someone I'm excited to bring you today because we've had a few conversations around bias safety, and he's going to put a lot of what we talk about today in the context of bias safety. Since we started talking about it, he's been applying bias safety both as a buyer and a seller, and it's having a profound effect. So I'd love to explore what that actually means in practice as well. Anthony, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kelke. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you for correcting my, uh, correctly uh, pronouncing my name. It's the third time in my entire working life. <laughs> Excellent. So, Anthony, would you mind giving us 60 seconds on your history and background, please? So, since 2015, I've built approximately 30 SaaS processes, designed them, and then built them with the applications and the words and the pictures. And I've been operating in uh, Asia Pacific. Most recently, in the last three years, I then wrote a book called Run Frictionless, How to Free a Founder from a Sales Role. And contained within the book is a framework called the Four Qs. Excellent. Okay. So tell me, what is the 4Q framework? So the 4Qs framework is a decision-making framework, and there are four quadrants of which each of the quadrants delivers value directly to our customer. So the first quadrant, who we serve. Second quadrant is what we serve. So that's the product or the service that you're selling to our customer in quadrant one. And quadrant three is who we are. Okay, so that's a little bit about the identity, the beliefs and the values of the organization. And the last, but my favorite, uh, quadrant four is how we serve. So this is what it feels like to become a customer of your business. Specifically, it's the minimum number of interactions required to create a customer. And so the fourth one again? How we serve. It's the how series serve. of interactions required to create a customer. Okay. That makes good sense. So in terms of frequently unasked but should be asked questions, talk to me about some of them when it comes to running their business. Well, typically, one of the mistakes that a lot of organizations make when I first begin talking to them is they're obviously not really tuned into buyer safety because one of the, one of the answers that they'll give me is, oh, we serve anyone. And, and I sort of scratch my head and go, I haven't met this fella called anyone. And in fact, when I talk to Sally, Judy or, or, or Tom, unless I speak directly to them, to them specifically, they're not convinced to buy it. And the argument that anyone can buy it is irrelevant to Tom, Sally and Harry. So the first question I, I, I want the organisation, which is a really difficult question to ask yourselves, whether you're a startup organisation or one that's been running for 50 years, is who do we serve today? So what are the specifications for the profiles that we serve today? I think that's the first question, Marcus. So the second one would be, who do we never serve? Because the antithesis of asking yourself the question of who do we serve, naturally you begin to understand the kinds of liabilities that you have in an organisation, the kinds of customers that look like assets, but in fact are liabilities are the ones which are more likely to leave negative reviews, ask for discounts, ask for refunds, and... So they're, they're the ones that in your heart of hearts, you know, if you try to serve them today, they're likely to leave you a negative review. And what I mean by a negative review is, is that's anything that could be written or verbalized. So that would be the second question. And the last question I would say is the big opportunity in the room is who do we serve tomorrow? So that's like we don't have maybe the feature, maybe that particular customer profile is a casual user and so it's not economical for us to serve them today. But there's something going on in quadrant two. We're changing the roadmap. And maybe in six months, we'll be ready to serve them. So instead of forcing the sale today and saying, we serve you today, we just have a very honest conversation with them and say, we're not ready to serve you today, but we think so in six months. Let's put you on a waiting list. Okay, interesting. Well, I think... One of the most common problems that I see in organizations, and it goes hidden for sometimes years, and there's a really good example of this um, with one of the companies I work with, White Rabbit, and um, we're working with a training company, 
and we ran their ideal customer profile. And it turned out for the last four years, they'd been selling to the wrong ICP. Within two and a half months, they'd grown sales 700% per month by focusing on the right ideal customer. And I think as part of quadrant one is who should we serve? And when was the last time we reviewed who we serve? What evidence do we have that we actually serve those people? And who are the people we serve best? Which I think, again, because most people, certainly in technology, I find they're on a land grab. They're after as many logos as possible. And so that taints who they look for. And as a result of that, they end up with the slew of the wrong type of customer, which eventually starts to catch up on them in the operations side. And I, I'm curious about the importance of the boundaries that operations or customer success can establish with sales in order to prevent that type of mistaken acquisition of a customer. I think White Rabbit is a, an amazing product in its own because what, uh, I mean, if let's say an organization didn't have White Rabbit, what would they do? Well, you could go back and look at sales history. You can look at all the deals that almost got done but didn't get done. You can look at where you got negative reviews because negative reviews are a really good way of understanding, like reversing back out of that to understand customers that you probably shouldn't have served. So if the company's been running for a while, they normally have a lot of internal intelligence within the organization itself where they can start to build a picture of their ideal customer that they ought to serve today. And I think your, I think your point about who they serve best, if I may rephrase it, would be right now there is a customer out there who desperately needs you right now. They actually really need you. And so this there's almost like a social aspect of this that we don't have time to squander that opportunity, our opportunity time on customers who really don't need us right now. If I was to think about how to get a good handshake between sales and customer success, I think what we've got to do is, is and this has become, I think, something that Silicon Valley has been doing now for a couple of years where they're saying, look, it's no longer good enough as a salesperson to make a transaction. What we want is T plus 30 days or T plus 60 days. We need a bunch of other KPIs other than the check in order to count them as a customer. That means that they remain a profile past the transaction and we need to hit other KPIs and it could be things like the amount of usage that they're getting out of the product, the amount of setup that they've done, whatever the parameter, whatever the metric is, the salesperson needs to be understand that their commissions are going to be paid on that. And that way, when the operations team have got intelligence to give back to the group about the kinds of customers that we ought not to serve today, or maybe even customers we should never serve, they're really listening and tuning into that because it's going to hit their pockets. Okay. So this then raises the next critical question, which is how do we modify compensation schemes to drive desirable behaviors to attract ideal customers and only ideal customers. Yeah, so when I've done this in the past, and I must, uh, I'll, I'll put it out there that I don't have the, the kind of experience doing this that a lot of your listeners have right now, but when I've asked to be do this, this is what the advice I've given. I say, pay 100% commissions on customers we serve today we have an ideal specification, a profile that the organization has agreed to. We've got those profiles somewhere on a shared drive, so that knowledge is understood. We pay 100% on those, and customers we serve tomorrow, we pay 50%. So we pay 50% to put them into the pipe, and then once we're ready to convert them into a customer that we serve today, the balance is paid out. Now, for both situations, the amount, the full amount should not be paid until we hit that metric past the transaction. So if you agree with me that customer success is about indeed buyer safety, has the, has the buyer really purchased the product that's right for them? We need some time to evaluate that. And I think by doing that, 
the salespeople become more prudent and maybe even ask a few more questions at the beginning to make sure that they are the right customer going into the funnel. Interesting. Okay. If we think about that blue sky selling, why is it that salespeople do that? And why is it tolerated? I think it starts with the founder. And I think it's where the founder will often be caught in a situation where they're delivering a 40,000 feet pitch, like that elevate, that, that pitch, yeah. that rah-rah speech that motivates people where we talk about the future. And when, it, when they do it really well, what they're doing is they're tangibilizing all that challenge that we have in the future and they're bringing it into the present and they're making it palatable. They're making people feel, I can do this. I can do this for the company. So they they deliver that and they do that very, very well. But and that's the internal is, speech. Right. That's the internal at your 9 a.m. WIP, let's get everybody fired up about how great this company is. That's the 40,000 feet pitch. And all of a sudden the telephone rings, okay, and they're now at the four feet pitch. This is like the rubber meets the road. There's a customer on the telephone. And what they begin to do is, is they sally those messages that they've taken from the 40,000 feet pitch into the pitch that now delivering to the customer. And there's a very interesting bias that I've seen time and time again where even if they try to cover their backsides by saying, we have something like this coming in the future, it's not here now, but it's coming next month. The customer does not hear that. What they hear is it's here right now. When they get off the phone, they think it's here right now. And so what the company's just done, the founder or that salesperson, is they've just made the sale contingent, sale today contingent on a feature tomorrow that hasn't been costed, hasn't been specified, hasn't even been tested in the code base yet. And you do this enough times, right? You do it enough times in the business, you future sell enough, you're just going to run the business into the ground because how much impact can your roadmap in quadrant two withstand if it's being hit by requests to serve specific customer features that had nothing to do with the roadmap that was intended? Yeah, it's the law of unintended consequences. And often it stems from sellers being feature sellers as opposed to trying to understand how the customer got to where they are today, what jobs they're trying to get done, what progress they're making, what obstacles and uh, roadblocks they're hitting. And as a result, they're not really joining the dots. I think an antidote to this, which is very powerful, but again, takes a lot of uh, a big swallow, is that you slow down to speed up. So for every minute you're in front of the customer, you have three minutes plus of rehearsal time. And what I found is that in the first couple of hours of rehearsal, people start picking up the obvious stuff. After the first couple of hours, they start joining the dots and they start seeing the, and then what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened. And it's there that you find the real gold. In, the, in your preparation. But if they've been selling blue sky and then they do, and then what happened and then what happened, they realize that they're going to get caught in a very, very bad trap of their own making. And it takes them away from that. But the problem is that most organizations that I've dealt with, and I'm not saying it's all of them, but at the moment, only 75% of reps hitting 80% or below of their quota, which is indicative of all sorts of other problems in terms of not enough emphasis on genuine pipeline building, pipeline nurturing. Uh, I was speaking to Jason Bay yesterday, and just to get one meeting, and this is a guy who does nothing but work with SDRs, it's roughly 250 actions per meeting. Now, when you consider that to get to a second meeting takes about 3,250 actions on behalf of the sales, uh, salesperson or sales team. That's a terrifyingly wasteful operation. And a lot of that can be dealt with by knowing who our actual customer is. Now, 
then we have uh, in quadrant two what we serve. So talk to me a little bit about that in particular in the context of biosafety again. You know, one of the uh, antidotes, as you called it, um, to future cell, it's amazing because when I first pre- put that term on the table, most CEOs or founders of companies will say, oh, no, look, our, our people know exactly what they're selling. I don't mm-hmm. take features and they'll sit there and write all the features for me. So I take those features away. So thank you very much for me. Just to, I'll, I'll come back to you in a week and let you know what I think. So I, I come back in a week and I says to the fellow, look, we ran blind blind tests on your, we interrogated your um, telephonists, your online chat artists. We hit your, we hit your email customer support people with the same sets of questions. And let me show you the divergence and all the answers that we get. No one in your company is selling your product in the same way. They don't know what they're selling. And it's really like manufacturing companies a long time ago got this. Like they release a product. It's in the warehouse. There's a, there's a number on every piece. Everything's labeled. All the limitations of the product are there. There's nothing hidden. And so they've realized a long time ago that you need to do this. But I think that when you're looking at software, because it's so ubiquitous and we've got software sprints happening every fortnight, people get really sloppy with documenting that what's actually in the product right now, what is in the warehouse. And so what happens is instead of releasing that information to the sales and marketing people and saying, look, guys, we've got a specification in Quadrant 2 now. This is all you can sell. There's nothing else. These are, the, these are the set of features that we have. Because they refuse to do that, the sales and marketing people end up just writing it themselves. And the best person to write that specification is not the sales and marketing people because they tend to inject a bit more into it. Um, it would be the product manager. So if I was thinking about biosafety, most organizations I've seen, they can't even get the features right, okay? But let's just say that we get past that base and we're thinking about biosafety. I think that Quadrant 2 operates on three levels. I'll explain the first one. We've talked about features. Yeah. But what we also need to do is we need to map limitations and known workarounds. Let me explain why, right? Customers learn as much about a product through the features as as much as they learn about it through what it doesn't do. It's part of the education process. It's a little bit like a television being shipped with a manual that says, very clearly on page two, do not operate in water. (laughs) Makes bloody sense, right? Don't operate in water. I wonder why they put that in there. I mean, they could have tried to put it somewhere deep down in the contractual stuff where you can't find it, but they just went, nope. Let me tell you all the things it can't do so you understand that this is actually an indoor product. It's not designed to be operated outside. They want you to have a good experience. They want you to write good reviews. They want to have, you know, a net promoter score that's worthy. So mapping limitations to the profiles in quadrant one, hence getting a quadrant one, two fit is really important. And if you go even further, even companies like Google who have a $1 billion market cap have workarounds. So what they do is, is that they, they acknowledge that their products have limitations. And then in the forums, they talk about the known workarounds, the manual operations, the other things, other applications you can get out there via API. Hey, we'll do it for you. Maybe the organization is so, will actually offer a separate human service to overcome that friction point, that limitation, and then therefore we offer you a workaround. The salesperson who can get a quadrant one, two fit faster looks like they're more confident This is not the first day they sold the product. Let me demo this for you. I'm on the phone. I'm imagining Sally. Okay, I've got a picture of Sally. She's she's it's an inbound call. This is a customer profile I serve today. I say, hey Sally, hang on. I'm going to make this so easy for you. I serve you all day long. I know exactly what your limitations are. Let me tell you all the limitations of the product. Hang on. Here are the workarounds. I'm going to table it in the first interaction with you. I'm not going to leave it for you to find it, dig it out. You come back to me later. You say, hey, Tom, you didn't tell me about this limitation. You tell me now when I'm at the cash register. What are you talking about? That's not how we build trust. 
the guy or the girl that can strike that quadrant one, two fit in the first interaction, just go straight through the limitations and the workarounds, just looks so confident because this, let's face it, right, Marcus, the smart buyers out there, they know that there's no product that can do everything. So if you just put it on the table quickly, they can make a buying decision. And this is why it's so important, always be rigorously authentic. That means you have to admit when there is a deficiency with the product and you do it early. And that way you can neutralize it or it becomes a condition. And a condition is something that cannot be overcome. Then you can part on amicable terms quickly without incurring cost or uh, deception. And interestingly enough, tying this to Charlie Green's trust equation, a good quadrant one, quadrant two fit is about creating reliability and credibility, which are the two logical levers in the formula. The third one is intimacy. And that's really understanding the other person, allowing them to lower their guard because nothing you do fires off their amygdala. Everything you do is focused around helping them achieve their outcome. And this is why customer centricity is so important. And the, the fourth lever in the trust equation, so reliability plus credibility plus intimacy over low self-orientation. Mm. So that then pushes us towards service, not trying to uh, create an adversarial relationship, but putting the customer's needs first, because that's how you get your needs met. But I think in this very transactional uh, type of sales environment, the emphasis is on new logo acquisition. It's on revenue generation with little or no thought to lifetime customer value to how you're going to retain that customer. I think um, part of the compensation should be a big payout on the third renewal. Not the first, not the second, but the third. Interesting. I like your thinking. I, I, I really like your thinking because now what you're really doing is, is that you're, you're almost now moving into quadrant three where you're talking about shared beliefs, where rather than just selling the customer on the features we have today, if we bring in customers whom we share beliefs with, that means a, a belief is why the founder or the business owner gets out of bed every day to come to work if they didn't make a salary. So if you didn't make revenue, which is the byproduct of a quadrant one, two fit, if you made no revenue today, what's your reason to exist? What's the reason to come to the office? And that's your belief. And the, the most important aspect of the belief is not whether you call it a belief, a mission, a vision, but whether or not it is shared with customers, staff, and shareholders. And what's interesting is, if you can strike a quadrant one, three fit with a customer and you bring them into your company, you've really got somebody who's going to be for the first sale, the second sale, and the third sale because they will accept higher prices in quadrant two, less features in quadrant two because these guys get me. Okay, let me put that in, in perspective for you. Here's what it sounds like when a customer has a quadrant one through one three fit with your organization, right? They'll say something like this. Oh my God, I've been telling people this for years and finally you guys are doing it. You see, they feel personally gratified. They think that you are listening to them really deeply. And when you explain why you get up in the morning, the problem you're trying to solve and how you're solving it in quadrant two, they get really energized about that. And they will forgive you for not delivering a great quadrant two because every, every company has a bad product day. We have rollbacks, we have bugs, we have all sorts of problems because overall they think these guys get me. I'm going to keep buying from them because they understand me and we're, we are together. We belong. And that is intimacy. That's the very definition of it. So again, as we think about how we build long-term relationships and long-term trust, and we build a mutually profitable and lucrative relationship, 
building on our lessons from what people are unhappy about is really important as well. And I think many organizations are very brittle when it comes to criticism. I've learned later in my life, if I'm being perfectly honest, that inviting conversation with critics, with people who are not happy, is the quickest way to improve your your product and go to market. And in fact, Salesforce did a study at the tail end of 2020 that suggests that companies that speak to unhappy customers have a 600% faster product development cycle than companies who don't. And the one constant in all of this is the customer. And what baffles me is why customers are not involved in the design of sales training, the execution of sales training, in the design and execution of uh, compensation schemes. Why are they not brought in more frequently as part of the, um, the, you know, the, the genius board to help you design your business in the right way? Because there, there is a really simple rule. Your business is perfectly designed today to deliver the results that you are getting. Now, the problem is, if you haven't designed it, it's still a design. And the results that you're getting are a direct byproduct of that design, whether it's been done intentionally or it's done by default. And that will be determined very often by the money behind you and the pressure they put down the chain of command, which then creates those unintended consequences. Yes. And I think another major problem is that there are so many organizations, certainly in tech, that are going after unicorn status, and they're on this huge land grab for growth uh, and logo acquisition without really thinking ahead of the unintended consequences for building a strong business on you know, firm foundations. But they don't care because they're planning to be out. So that then raises some really interesting questions around culture and uh, around the relationship that you form with your customers. So I'd be curious how the quadrants have helped create lifetime customers and ra- you know, raving fans. Yeah. The interesting part of quadrant three is operationally, it's really, really difficult to pull off. And that's why when you get it right, it's so defensible. Um, look, you know, companies will rip off quadrant two. They'll steal all your features. They'll try and reverse engineer back out of your FAQs. Quadrant two is gone. So um, if all you do is go after a quadrant one, two fit, you are going to become a commodity. And a lot of those shareholders, those unicorn companies, that's all they care about because the byproduct of a quadrant one, two fit is just revenue. And as long as they see revenue, they think the company's healthy. They don't perceive the high churn in, in staff and they don't perceive high customer churn as an issue, which is dealt with quadrant three. Quadrant three is really about long-term scalability. You can cut corners on it in the first couple of years, but you keep doing it and you're going to burn the company to the ground. And in fact, there's a really good story that Tony Shea put out there in his book, Delivering Happiness is the former CEO of Zappos. He talks about his first business. He goes, he says this, he says, you know what? I used to come to my own company of 120 people and I can't stand them. None of them share the same belief as me. The customers don't, the staff don't. And the the type of internal friction that he was feeling every day that it was so difficult to get things done because there was no culture, there was no common shared belief between the staff or the customers. All he got was pushback every time he tried to make a change. What did he do? He sold it to Microsoft. He got a healthy payout, but I think what Tony really wanted to do was he just wanted to divest himself of a company where there was no quadrant one, two fit. He was like, I'm done. We've got the one, two, three, what the one, two fit. That's all Microsoft can see. That's all my shareholders can see. Fine, I'm out the door. Going to go and do another company. And culture became a very, very big part of Zappos, which was the second business that he did. Mm-hmm. So the part that's so hard to operationalize is it's inside out. There is no marketing organization that's out there that can help you do this. They cannot help with this. They'll put very nice words on the on the wall. 
the CEO will get a hard on. You'll look at it every day or she will <laughs> and, and get super excited about all this stuff that they've done and nobody, the staff don't believe it and the customers call in, they're facing the same staff who've had the same attitude that they had before. So all that public relations has been blown. They have been deceived. They've been brought in to think, oh, we have this new Quadrant 1, 3 fit. I, I, I actually think I fit with this. I'm going to come to this company. They've changed now. But you get inside past the marketing veneer, right? It's all the same rubbish you had before. So it's really hard to operationalize this because you've got to bring on the right staff and the right customers who share that belief. And then the third piece of the puzzle is the shareholders. Because if all they care about is making money, all they care about is a quadrant one, two fit. And, and by the way, staff and customers, they don't care about making money, right? Because um, unfortunately, they're not going to get, most of them will never actually get anything out of that, unless, of course, they've got um, really good compensation plans and they're all going to be part of that. But certainly customers are not going to be part of that. They're going to get burnt from that. Well, the customer seems to become an inconvenient, forgotten afterthought at the end of a long chain of abuse in my book. And it's heartbreaking to see because when you calculate the hidden costs inside businesses of customer churn, now 15% is considered perfectly reasonable. But that means that it, well, you're, you're losing 49% of your customers every three years. That creates incredible unnecessary pressure at the top end of the funnel. So just to stand still, you have to find one eleventh of your turnover every year. Now, that's a big chunk. In fact, it's not even one eleventh, it's one seventh, one sixth, something like that. So you're working way harder than you need to. You have a sales and marketing process that considers it okay to bombard you know, 100,000 emails or a million emails out without realizing that, by and large, they've been blacklisted. So all that effort is wasted. They produce bland, anodyne content that is all me, me, me. It's about the company, the products, the features, without putting context into it, without building any emotion into it. It's like the product, uh, product manager wrote the ad. And that's not the purpose of that content. That content is out there to educate, to raise awareness, to attract, to deliver value. Otherwise, it's just noise. I don't, I don't know how many ads we're getting exposed to nowadays you know, uh, under the pandemic. It's probably significantly fewer than the 10,000 that we were getting before. But now we're getting it in our inbox. So uh, either through LinkedIn or uh, email. And we're just getting drowned. The, the noise is drowning out the good stuff. Emails, I get between 200 and 500 a day. It's ludicrous. Now, I'm pretty sure that's extreme. But filtering through all of that takes me probably about two hours. So often, I just think, if it's important, they'll email again. Picking up the phone. People are reluctant to pick up the phone very often because they get inundated with noise. And the sales calls do not offer the promise of value. And even if they do, they often fail. So people become inured to that. And I think as a profession, we're creating the co uh, conditions collectively, which is why now you know, a third of B2B buyers interviewed by Gartner want a 100% seller-free buying experience. And 67% of people interviewed by Salesforce in 2020 said that they consider sales and salespeople to be morally bankrupt. Now, 33 and 67% makes pretty much 100. To my mind, we have to do something as a profession. And we have to decide that we've taken a very wrong turn and we need to do something about it. But by the sounds of things, it's difficult work. So what conditions need to exist for someone at a leadership level to buy into making these changes, to put together a, an effective four quadrants? Yeah, well, I think 
if you're a, if you're an organization that's been running longer than five years and you're doing one to 10 million pounds in turnover, as the leadership team, you really need to be exercising quadrant three. If you're not making that investment every day and reminding people about what their shared beliefs are. So like one really good example, I saw a CEO, he, I coached him on this. He's been doing it now for a while. He does it so well. Every second meeting, every second rah-rah meeting, uh, you'll have people there who talk about product, people there who are talking about marketing, people there who are talking about some um, customer experience. He'll just hero one or two situations where he thought a staff member or a customer was a really good exemplification of their shared belief, and he'll just explain why. So he or she will explain, this is a really classic example of where we got a really good Quadrant 1-3 fit and how it's working for us. So just keeping that top of mind every day so that when we understand the beliefs, what we then have underneath beliefs, if you get the belief that one sentence correct, once you've got that in place, you then have just two or three, two or three values which reinforce the belief. They underpin it. Because quite often, trying to go from a belief to making a decision can be really difficult. So let's just say you've got an organization of 100 people and they're making 10 decisions a day. That's 1,000 decisions. It's really hard for them to make a decision in line with the belief. But if they have a series of values which are aligned to the belief, it becomes easy for them just to say, well, if I make this kind of decision today, I can see how it's really well aligned to one or more of these values. Can you give an example? of the belief statement and the underpinning values, put it into okay. context. Uh, a really good example would be, let's talk about that uh, accounting software called Zero. okay? So Zero, from the day that they were founded, their mission was to create beautiful accounting software. That's their belief. They, they believe that bookkeepers and accountants should not have to look at ugly software all day. You shouldn't have to look at Excel spreadsheets. You should look at really nice, pretty numbers. Just because you're an accountant or a bookkeeper doesn't mean that numbers need to look ugly. We can make them look beautiful. If you believe, if you share this belief, come and buy zero. Okay. So that's a really good example of their belief, yeah? Excellent. And the underpinning values to that? Yeah, so in that organisation, I haven't actually read gone in and, and actually read their uh, annual reports to see what they're claiming to be their, their individual values. But I suspect that one of them would be minimalism, okay? So what, what, what the CEO would talk about is let's discuss minimalism. What does it mean? And then if you do it really well, you take that value from quadrant three, and this is how you get your quadrant three, four fit. You go... For every value that we have, let's take the one called minimalism, we need to exercise it once, demonstrate it once in quadrant four. That means those 10 or 15 interactions that we have to create a customer. So in our research, it's if you're serving small business owners, it's between 10 to 15 interactions required to create a customer. And if, it's, if you're serving enterprise decision makers, it's 25 upwards, maybe 50 you're supporting. You need to take that value, not just talk about it and write it on the wall. You need to operationalize it. You need to prove to the company and show where the customer is going to experience minimalism. And you need to do it once, at least once. Companies that do it really well will make sure that they experience that value multiple times in quadrant four. They'll pay the price because you can sit down and take all these values. And I can tell you unequivocally that like that value you've got there, that's going to cost us $60,000 to operationalize. Oh, we don't need that anymore. We don't need that value. Actually, we don't need 10 values. We figured it out. We just need these three. Okay, fantastic. We can get rid of the other seven because they're vanity values. They're just for yourselves. And the moment you've actually got to pay to demonstrate them, they're not important anymore. We don't have to talk about them. Fantastic. So we've got three now we need to operationalize, and that's a nice number. Just two or three in quadrant three is enough. Let's now take each of them, go into quadrant four, and make sure that we demonstrate them at least once. They have to be felt by the customer. Okay. 
And so this then raises the question around the um, levels of intimacy that the selling organization has with the buying organization, because unless you've got that access, unless you have that open dialogue, unless you're co-developing the solutions uh, with them, chances are that you're going to try and impose the square peg into the round hole. So how do you make sure that uh, as you're building these sales systems and these sales frameworks, um, that that element is built into the sales methodology? It's a good point. And buyer safety, we need, we, need to, we need to share that belief with customers and I'll give you a very simple way in quadrant four that we found that we could do it. So for a long time now, we've been building PowerPoint presentations like pitch decks and that sort of business for clients. Um, let's just say you've got a, a 20, 20 slide product pitch. What we'll typically do is, is we'll dedicate the first five slides, not to product, not to quadrant two. We just dedicate the first five slides to talking about why we get up in the morning, the problem we're trying to solve and why or how we're going about solving it, generally speaking, in, in quadrant two. What we're doing here is, is during this interaction, we're looking around the room and we're making eye contact with every decision maker at the table. And we're looking for one of three responses. We're looking for head nodding. I'll come back to that one in a moment. Then we're looking for indifference actually just don't care, or we're looking for absolute hostility. Any three of these in reactions are all perfectly awesome. They're all great responses. Obviously, if we're going to be met with hostility, that's fantastic because we want them to do that right now. If they think that our we're solving a problem that doesn't exist in a way that they think is uncharacteristic, I want to know now because I want to eject them in the early game from the sales system. I want them out of the way so I can get on with serving customers who do believe. We did a really interesting study. The question came up from a CEO. He said to me, can we change people's beliefs? And I said, you know what? I don't know, but I'll give it a go. Give me your two best salespeople. I need uh, 10 hours from them every week for the next six months. Let me see what I can do. And what we did was, First of all, the results were appalling. We only converted, we only changed the beliefs of 5% of the people we spoke to. Of the 5%, only 2.5% could be converted in a fortnight, and the other balance took three to six months. So what we learned very quickly is you can't change their beliefs. So why are you serving them in quadrant four? We need to identify that they do not believe in the solution we have and they don't believe in the problem. We need to get that out of the way because they're going to become a real problem for us later because they'll start trying to write our roadmap for us and giving us a whole bunch of intelligence that we don't want to hear but we've been obliged to because we served them. So of those three, right, we've got head nodding, that's where they're looking at you and they're going, oh, yeah, let me tell you a story. So what they'll do is they'll repeat the belief back in their own words. Mm -hmm. This is someone that you want to get, you want to get ready to sell them those other 15 slides, which are going to be on the product. They're about to buy. Those other people, you're packing up. There's no product today. You can throw all the product you like at them. They haven't bought into those first five slides. You are wasting your time showing them the quote, the product demonstration. You just go, you know what, folks? Fantastic. Glad to meet you all. Have a great day. Okay. Whilst I absolutely agree with that, people who have a weak, empty, inconsistent pipeline, people who are behind quota, will find that a very difficult decision to make. So yeah, I think that there is a really important early stage. The, the problem that you face today is really a byproduct of the causes that you either ignored or missed yesterday. And it's interesting. The, the, in Sandler, they talk about the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem. I also think that the solution that the customer has in mind is often not the right solution because 
very frequently what they're doing is they're seeing the problem through the symptoms they experience in their little silo. So there is a, a huge issue here, which is lack of alignment and lack of communication across all the key revenue operations functions. So marketing, lead gen, sales, customer success, account growth, and then feeding back into product development, feeding back into the ancillary services like legal and finance. And I'm curious how a well-oiled, run frictionless kind of business creates that alignment and communication between the silos in order to make sure that the customer is still at the heart of everything they do? Yeah, it's a really good question. And if you asked me 24 months ago, I wouldn't have an answer. But um, recently, in the last year, there was a very interesting fellow called Tim Wagner, who's a change manager consultant in Singapore. He's adopted the 4Qs framework. He uses it, does digital transformation. His focus is on people. That's his kind of slant. What he explained to me, he, he schooled me on this, and he said, look, what the 4Qs is going to allow you to do is because once you... You start to just use it as a decision-making tool. Are we describing a quadrant one, two fit today? Are we talking about a one, three fit, a one, four fit, a two, three, a two, four, a one, two, four? It's really easy now just to break through the jargon from various departments because people often talk about the same problem using different words. This will allow you to talk about a problem and narrow it because the words we're using have been standardized. And I've got that feedback from a lot of uh, CTOs and operations people who use it, who are kind of clued onto that thought that that's quite important to them to breaking down silos. But what's really interesting is he showed me how you can create a virtual team or a virtual innovation team. So what we do is we organize, say, the top 10, 15, either by title or influence, those people into one or more quadrants depending on the kind of functions they perform, so which one they're most likely to align to. And then we make one of them the quadrant leader. They're going to be responsible for the specification. Okay, So they're responsible for that specification. We're talking earlier about who we serve today, tomorrow, never. Um, features, limitations, workarounds in quadrant two. Likewise, quadrants three and four. And so we have different leaders. And then what happens is, is that as we get intelligence coming into the organisation, we're watching this intelligence could come from White Rabbit, could come outside the organization like White Rabbit, or it could come internally from salespeople, customer care people. As this intelligence is coming in, we meet once a week and we understand, we start to build stories out of that intelligence. And then we start to go, oh my God, I can see how um, if we make this change in quadrant one, and we just make that very, very slight change of, of moving someone from who we serve tomorrow to who we serve today, We've got the folks here in quadrant four who go, whoa, 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 hang on. We actually don't have a set of interactions ready to serve that profile. They're radically different. Yes, technically it's the same product in quadrant one, but hang on, man. Enterprise are not going to do self-service. What are you talking about? We've got a whole bunch of new experiences we need. We need, we need budget and we need time. So they can make decisions and go, <clears throat> if we've got $5 to spend this month, the intelligence is coming in. We've got five chips to put down. Which quadrants are we going to put them in? How are we going to drive the fastest ROI we can for the company? That's how they can do it. Once a week, sifting that intelligence, then say, here are going to be our projects. I can see who's in all quadrants. I can see all the processes in those quadrants. And now I know how this change is going to impact the business and whether or not we think it will reduce friction. Very interesting. That's all Tim's mean, work, by the way. That was Tim. He, he, he schooled me on this. He's a, he's a, he's a genius, this guy. <laughs> well, talent creates genius steals. So, okay, this has been incredibly insightful. Thank you. Tell me this. You, you have a golden ticket, and you can go back and advise the idiot Anthony, age 23. What choice bit of advice would you whisper in his ear? Strike a quadrant one, three fit earlier. I, I think that surrounding myself personally in my own life with more people who I belong to, mentors, 
friends, even within my own family, aligning myself with the people that I feel like I belong to and who belong to me. If I just got that down pat earlier in my life, I would have been more successful now. Good advice. A question that I'm starting to ask more frequently. If you were to pick one area that you see sales really evolving as a result of the pandemic, the speed with which technology is moving, and so on, I'd be curious um, to, to get your snapshot on the future of sales. Again, you, I mean, feel free to just pick one area. Thank you. You know, in quadrant four, one of the experiences that we've been teaching people is personalized video greetings because we've got people suffering Zoom fatigue and there's actually a lot of friction in trying to organize a Zoom call, the whole appointment setting, business, then trying to get everyone on the call. Oh, I forgot to be on the call. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I've got no internet. So there's all this friction surrounding that interaction and days and days and days are just going by, right? And the customer's expiring. So one of the ways just to short circuit that and just get quadrants two and three directly into the hands of the customer faster is through personal video. And personal video works really well when, you know, you're using applications like White Rabbit or you've got really good intel coming in and you know exactly who Sally is. You can just blow them away because what happens is, is you anticipate all the issues that they're going to have and you can address all of them in a personal video all within the first interaction. And they go, wow, that's like 90% of the stuff I needed to know. How do they even know that I had these questions? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Excellent. So personal video is a really good way to do that. Uh, absolutely. And I think one of the problems that I see with a lot of salespeople is they tend to favor one or two media. And uh, as a result, they're not necessarily adapting to how people consume content nowadays. Video is absolutely key. Audio is key. Vo you know, voice activated technology is on the up. We're starting to see AI creep into pretty much everything. And the dehumanizing of the marketing and sales process, I think, is a major handicap because people are sacrificing the speed and efficiency or rather they're sacrificing the humanity of it for speed and efficiency. But the long-term cost, I think, is exceptionally high. And that's how we, and we witness it in high staff turnover, high churn uh, of customers, uh, high levels of customer complaints. And so one of the things that I'm uh, building into the companies that I'm working with is that customer success is the, f uh, the final arbiter as to whether we take on a customer. Um, mm. So sales can't get it past, get it over the line unless customer success gives it the green light. Now that slows things down, but it means that we have less remedial work to do later. Yeah, there's a really good interaction in there that I saw one company implement in Quadrant 4 in the United Kingdom back in 2015. I was working, building the sales system there. And I remember one of the, um, one of the smartest salespeople he was also, he kind of also did a lot of customer success as well. He'd been with the company a long time. His only interaction in Quadrant 4 was to call every inbound. So once the customer, once we've got all the particulars, they're about to do the transaction or they've done the transaction, he would call them personally and just walk them through and say, look, I just want to make sure you understood what you bought. And this is what you're getting into. This is how much time it's going to take to do the onboarding. These are some of the consequences that we're going to have to change in your business. You're okay with that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Just done, bang, bang, bang. Okay, good. So he would almost pre-flight it for the customer success people to make sure that the project had a very high success rate. But he was also looking after the customer to make sure the salespeople did a right job. And then he would gather anything that the salespeople he felt hadn't done correctly, and that would become part of the next training program to improve that piece, make it a little bit better next time. Very interesting. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, uh, Anthony, we've come to time. How can people get hold of you? Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, they can just hit uh, runfrictionless.com or key search my name in LinkedIn, Anthony Condoris, and either one is good for me. Excellent. Anthony Condoris, thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be on the show and look forward to continuing our discussions together. 
Excellent. So thank you. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this useful, insightful, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And feel free to give it an honest review on Apple or Google Podcasts. Um, a one-star or a five-star, welcome all of them. In the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, you can email me, marcus at laughs-last.com, or direct message me on LinkedIn. And if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone else who would, then ping me a note and let's see if we can get them on. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.